Good afternoon to everyone, and, and thank you for coming to this uh, side event. This is a side event focused on um, the cooperation between the ICC and the UNODC on enforcement. And the aim of this is, of course, to encourage state parties to enter into enforcement agreements with the court. As you are well aware, um, there will be, hopefully very soon, uh, an even bigger need for these enforcement agreements, and only eight states parties so far have seen uh, a possibility to enter into this agreement. And, and uh, I often think that sometimes we could achieve more if we just had a little bit more knowledge, and, and um, this is, as I said, the, the aim of this session. Uh, without further ado, I am very pleased to see that the, the president uh, himself is here, and I would like to give him the floor for some introductory remarks. President Song, you have the floor. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to begin by thanking the Netherlands for hosting this event and Norway for uh, providing it with financial support. <clears throat> with the handing down on the 1st of December of the conviction in the Lubanga case for the enlistment, conscription, and use in armed hostilities of children under the age of 15, it is both timely and fitting that I'm here today to speak on the issue of enforcement of sentences. The work of the ICC rests on two pillars. The judicial pillar represented by the ICC and the cooperation pillar represented by both the ICC and the states. Both are vital to the proper functioning of the court and to achieving the goals of the Rome Statute system. Today, I would like to share some information on the enforcement regime that forms an integral part of the cooperation pillar and our partnership with the United Nations in this regard. <clears throat> Let me begin by elaborating a little bit further on the role and the relationship of the ICC and state parties when it comes to cooperation and enforcement. As you are aware, under the Rome Statute, uh, state parties undertake to cooperate with the ICC. One of the key forms of cooperation set down by the Rome Statute is the enforcement of sentences. The ICC's enforcement regime is based on three primary principles, which shape the responsibilities of both ICC and states in this regard. One, sentences are to be served in the prison facilities of the state of enforcement subject to that state's laws. Two, the state of enforcement is bound by the sentence that the ICC imposes. And three, the ICC supervises the enforcement of the sentence. In practice, this regime functions as two-step process, which we call double consent. <clears throat> the first step begins when a state party informs the presidency of the ICC that it is willing to enforce the sentences of the court. At this point, the state party and the presidency enter into discussions with the aim of concluding a bilateral agreement. The purpose of the agreement is, one, to formalize the expression of the state's party's willingness to accept 
sentenced person, and two, to consolidate in one document all the legal provisions governing the enforcement of sentences. The state is free during the negotiations to attach conditions to its agreement, which the president can accept or not depending in particular on their compatibility with the Rome Statute. The state also remains free, even after the agreement's conclusion, to withdraw or amend those conditions subject to the president's confirmation. To make this process as state-friendly as possible, the ICC has developed a model enforcement agreement based on the statutes, rules, and regulations of the court and drawing on the experience of the ad hoc international criminal tribunals. This model agreement provides a starting point for negotiations between the presidency and the state party. It has proved a very useful tool in the negotiation process, and no state has requested dramatic amendments to that. Once an agreement is reached and enters into force, the state is added to the ICC's list of states willing to enforce our sentences. Being added to the list does not bind the state party to accept any specific prisoners, however, <clears throat> as it merely completes the first of two, the two steps in the double consent, consent process. The second step comes when the presidency designates a state from that list to enforce a specific sentence. Once chosen, the state can then decide if it will consent to receiving this particular prisoner, notifying the presidency promptly of its decision. If the state agrees to enforce the specific sentence, the ICC will then transfer the prisoner to the state as soon as possible. If the state declines, the presidency will designate another state from the list. If no state accepts the designation, the sentence is enforced in the host state. The presidency considers many relevant factors when it is deciding which state to designate. These include the principles of equitable distribution, the views and nationality of the convicted person, and the international treaty standards governing the treatment of prisoners. Consistent with the governing principles that I listed earlier, the ICC supervises the enforcement. This means that the state cannot change the sentence or release the prisoners early. And the enforcement must be consistent with, at the minimum, widely accepted international treaty standards. States are, of course, free to set higher standards. The actual condition of imprisonment are governed by the laws of the receiving state, but must be equivalent to the conditions applied to other prisoners in that state who were convicted of similar offenses. The ordinary costs for the enforcement of sentence in the territory of the, of the state are borne by that state, whereas the ICC covers other costs, including transport of the sentenced person. As you can see, this system provides for considerable freedom of choice 
for our state's parties. In particular, the double consent uh, mechanism means that states must declare willingness to accept prisoners in general, and then again on a case-specific basis. However, the high degree of autonomy for states that is provided by the regime does not mean that this issue is of lesser importance than other types of cooperation with the court. Rather, it is there to ensure that states parties are able to undertake responsibilities in accordance with the Rome Statute in a, in a way that is consistent with their domestic legal systems and circumstances at the time. Yet to date, only 7% of our state's parties have concluded framework agreements with the ICC on the enforcement of sentences. Although we are also in the middle of negotiating a few more of these agreements, the total number is only a fraction of what the ICC really needs for a healthy and effective enforcement regime. The ICC's activities continue to grow and expand. At the moment, we have an unprecedented six cases at trial stage. We need to be prepared to enforce any sentences that may, may be handed down in the near future. I recognize that some states parties have expressed the interest in signing framework agreements, but are unable to do so because their prison systems do not meet the standards required to enforce a sentence issued by the ICC. We acknowledge this hurdle, and we have been working together with the United Nations proactively seeking ways to make a cooperation possible in such, a, in such a circumstances. For example, a few months ago, the ICC concluded a memorandum of understanding with the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime, UNODC, which is the UN body that acts as the guardian of international standards and norms governing the treatment of prisoners and management of prison facilities and provides related technical assistance to states. Clearly, they are a natural partner for us in this regard. The MOU will enable the UNODC to work with the state's parties towards enforcing ICC sentences, for instance, by sharing information and assisting with state capacity building. This partnership between the ICC and the UNODC is a concrete step in helping states to fulfill their responsibilities in a manner that is consistent with the Rome Statute. In conclusion, let me stress that the enforcement regime is vital to the Rome Statute system. It is a cornerstone of the cooperation pillar, underpinning a well-functioning system that has the full support and engagement of the state's parties. In doing so, it also strengthens the judicial pillar it is the enforcement phase, after all, that gives the work and decisions of the court real weight and effect and signals the seriousness of our mandate. Therefore, I would like to take this opportunity to urge state parties to consider concluding a framework agreement with the ICC on the enforcement of sentences, and bear in mind that <clears throat> where assistance is required, 
the ICC and the United Nations are working to make it available to you. For this is only through the conclusion of such agreements and the commitment of states' parties to a strong enforcement regime that the Rome Statute system's ultimate goal of ending impunity can be achieved. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, President Song, for your introduction. I would then like to pass the floor to, to Ms. Simone Monasidian. Uh, she is Director of the New York Office of the UNODC, and she will give a, a general introduction. You have the floor, Simone. Thank you, Ambassador, and I thank the President for his important remarks and for the inspiration he's given all of us in the UN to work more closely with the court and, and the flexibility in finding the ways forward on that. Um, it's really an honor to have been working with the president on, on this MOU and his very talented um, team. Um, you and ODC and, and the ICC have, as the president has just mentioned, recently entered into an MOU on building the capacity of states to enforce in accordance with international standards on the treatment of prisoners, sentences of imprisonment pronounced by the court. And last week, some of you may also recall that we participated, UNODC participated in a side event on cooperation in victim and witness matters in light of another recent MOU between the ICC and UNODC on strengthening the capacity of states in the area of witness protection. So UNODC has a long history of cooperation with the ICC, in particular on witness um, issues, um, and has uh, participated in capacity building activities that the court has participated in our capacity building activities. And we look forward to strengthening cooperation with the court in terms of enforcement of sentences in accordance with international prison standards. It is, after all, how we treat those who are the least among them, among us, that is a measure of our civilization. And we at UNODC believe in that very strongly when it comes to prisons and their standards. UNODC, um, some of you may say, well, what are we involved with this? We're the Office of Drugs and Thugs, no? We're an office that's committed to ensuring that the standards and norms related to criminal justice are not only widely known, but widely implemented. And we provide important technical assistance in, in that regard. And you will hear from one of the lights in that area in our office, Philip Meisner, um, after my very short remarks. Um, many of us in, in my office in New York, as well as several of us in, in UNODC in Vienna, come from the tribunal family background. I know you served at three of, of the courts before coming to UNODC, and everybody in my office, our small UNODC New York office, have all served either in the ICTR, ICTY, ICC, or special court. Um, because we know that in those courts, you have to do a lot with very little often, and you become creative and understand that there's no time to waste. Um, so in the field of criminal justice, UNODC serves not only as the guardian of the UNTUC, the UN Convention Against Transnational Organized Crime, but also these standards and norms in crime prevention and criminal justice, including those related to the management of prison facilities and the tr treatment of prisoners. And some of you may also know that based on the Secretary General's Policy Committee decision of 2012 that UNODC the Office of Legal Affairs and the High Commissioner for Human Rights are the three leading agencies that are um, taking the way forward on the rule of law at the international level. And we see this very much as part of our efforts to work collectively, OLA, UNODC, and OHCHR, with the court and other partners on furthering the rule of law at, at the international level, level. Here in the General Assembly last week, a very important resolution on cooperation in criminal law, which is every year led by the Permanent Mission of Italy, also talked about the importance of this issue of enforcement of sentences and of UNODC providing technical assistance to ensure that prisons are met with the international standards that is expected of us in the UN. And so we're very happy to see the trend in the General Assembly is to encourage this kind of important work in all contexts, be it in the ICC or be it in um, other conventional court systems. There is no place where these rules and standards should not exist. And that is why this is part and parcel of UNODC's work. Um, 
As of February 2014, UNODC's growing prison reform portfolio, some $35 million, encompasses programs in more than 14 states. We also act as the secretariat for the ongoing intergovernmental process of revising the standard minimum rules for the treatment of prisoners. And following up on ASP resolution from 2010's review conference on strengthening the enforcement of sentences, um, the purpose of our MOU is cooperation between UNODC and ICC in order to strengthen the court's enforcement pillar, as the president mentioned. A particular focus will be the imprisonment of sentenced individuals in states designated by the court in line with Part 10 of the Rome Statute. Um, similarly to the ICC, the ICTR and the ICTY have both relied on the cooperation of states, as does the residual mechanism. The actual process of identifying states willing to accept sentence prisoners and of developing respective sentence enforcement agreements was a difficult one for both tribunals. Um, the ICTR's registry has once explained that a sticking point has always been whether the state concerned can meet the international minimum standards of looking after convicted persons that the UN would expect any state that accepts to host convicted persons to adhere to. While many states in the developing nations have the political will to cooperate in this regard, they often lack the necessary financial and material resources to comply with international minimum standards that international courts and tribunals are mandated to provide. So neither the ICTR or ICTY have been able to really engage in delivering extensive technical assistance programs to member states who have agreed to accept respective individual sentences individuals sentenced by the tribunals. And they have indicated that this was not within their mandate or their budget, and the limited capacity of the ICTR, for example, to engage in capacity building is not dissimilar to that of the ICC. In particular, as the ASP has made it clear, the, the ICC should not become a development organization or an implementing agency. And that's why these partnerships with the UN, including UN Office on Drugs and Crime, are, are so important. So as the guardian of international standards and norms, um, UNODC puts these standards into practice um, by providing technical assistance to build fair and effective criminal justice systems. Um, you will hear more about them from Philip. Uh, one of the places that we, we've done so with much success has been in the area of counter piracy. Um, and we, we learned a lot. There, we went in a very small way first, and, and you'll hear from Philip that we're, we're trying to go in a small way with pilot programs here, and we need your assistance for those pilot programs. But there, we went in, into Kenya, thanks to the Kenyan's government willingness and some other countries in, in the Horn of Africa, to um, make sure that there was a prison that could take some of these uh, pirates. And so what happened, or these, those accused of piracy? We built a part of the prison in, in, in Mombasa, for um, those uh, who were either accused of piracy or who would have been sentenced as pirates. And we learned, well, those who are in the same jail for conventional crimes are now having separate standards from those who are there for piracy. And we had to address that and also make sure that there was consistency in the prison there. But then we learned something else. Many of the guards in Mombasa, they came either from Nairobi or elsewhere in Kenya and they had conditions that were not even as good as the prisoners, be they those who are waiting trial for piracy crimes or for conventional crimes. And so now we have to work with the donors to make them understand how all of this is related to ensure that there were conditions for the guards. And then when we went to Somalia, we had a new problem. All of these conventional, um, all the pirates were men. And so now we've built the, the court, the, the prison conditions in Somalia in a way that is consistent, be it for a conventional crime or for a piracy-related crime, as well as for the guards. But what happened was all of them were male prisoners in the piracy and the conventional crimes. Um, the women didn't have such facilities. So we've had to learn a lot working on conditions, and we hope to bring that wealth of expertise, be it in piracy or other transnational organized crime manifestations, to our technical assistance provision that we would provide for members who would sign on to MO, who would uh, be willing to take uh, prisoners from the ICC. And Philip will tell you about what the MOU's provisions are and what UNODC plans to do in the future. Um, technical assistance and, and provision of um, 
information and, and cooperation. But what I would like to end with now is that we are looking into pilot programs, and the ICC and UNODC is going to engage in joint fundraising efforts for these pilot programs. Um, we count on all of you who are here from various um, party member states to talk to each other and, and come back to us and see how you could partner with us to support this very important work. Um, we will continue to report to all of you on the progress we make in this area, but absent the financial muscle being put for these efforts, for countries who really want to do something about these issues, we're not going to get as far as we need to go. And with that, I, I introduce my wonderful colleague, Philip Meisner, who is uh, the, is, is it Philip? Or, oh, sorry, it's, it's Hirat. It's, it's, it's okay, Hirat. we can do it either way. I give it back to the, <laughs> to, the <laughs> to the mistress of ceremonies who knows better than I do. Thank you very much for your introduction. Um, and yes, in fact, I would like to give the floor to Hirad now. <laughs> um, Hirad Abtai, who is a legal advisor uh, in the presidency of the ICC, uh, who would also like to build further on this before we give the floor to Philip. Hirad, you have the floor. Thank you, Ambassador. <clears throat> I'll, be, I'll be short because most of the general issues have been already covered by President Song and by, by Simon. So I'm going to maybe focus a bit more on some of the legal and practical aspects of the enforcement functions of the presidency. I don't think I'll go beyond five minutes so everybody can have more Q&A time for later. Um, the, the ICC is a bit unlike the other courts and tribunals of a supranational character. Um, the powers, the, f the responsibility for enforcement have been uh, given to the presidency of the court. In the other courts and tribunals, it's, it is usually the registrar in charge. Um, in so doing, um, one or two provisions should be uh, borne in mind. One is Article 103, Paragraph 3, Subparagraph A, and Rule 201 of the Rules of Procedure and Evidence, in um, accordance to which uh, states' parties share the responsibility of uh, to carry out the sentence of enforcement uh, pronounced by the court. This means that there has to be an equitable geographic distribution, which is really important. This is all in the statute. And uh, on the other hand, that each uh, state party, which is on the list of states of enforcement, and be given, must be given an opportunity to receive sentence person. Um, and in addition to that, the number of states uh, sentence persons already received by that state um, and other states of enforcement should be balanced. So it's quite a delicate exercise that has to be carried out by the presidency of the court. So far among its 122, uh, among the 122 states parties uh, to, the, to the Rome Statute. Um, uh, now, per President, so I gave you the percentage figure of states that have concluded an agreement. I'll give you the, the absolute figures. We have eight of them. Um, in fact, with seven of them, the enforcement agreement is enforced because the eighth one, which is Colombia, we are still waiting for the domestic ratification. Other states' parties with which we have concluded have also gone through the same process. So we've got Austria, Belgium, Denmark, Finland, and the UK, Serbia, Mali, and we have uh, Colombia, as I mentioned. So apart from Colombia with the other uh, states uh, parties, the agreement is in force. Now, in practice, what happens is that the president of the court sends a letter, a standard letter to states parties um, and, and reminds them of Article 103 and asks them to indicate indicate whether they are willing to be put on the list of states of enforcement. There is no obligation that can be imposed, so it's just a question. Um, practically, a very high number of these letters remain unanswered. Uh, we do send regularly a reminder, but when I said unanswered, I mean taking into account the reminders, they remain unanswered. A smaller portion uh, does say that yes, they are willing to conclude, and among those smaller portions, there are the eight, eight that I've mentioned, and a number of others with which we have, we have been negotiating, and one of them made it uh, public, I may say it now, uh, a few days ago, which is Norway. 
uh, saying that we are in the final stages. Usually we don't make public on the state, state party itself is willing to do so, the status of the negotiations because of various reasons that everybody will be able to understand. Um, then there is another uh, group, a third and last group, which answers in a qualified manner. Uh, either, just to cite you some examples, I will take only state parties that are my nationals. Well, this we cannot uh, go, go, go in this manner because then it becomes, we get 122, each of them only taking their own nationals. But there is a bigger group, and that is the main reason why, which has led us to this uh, round table, which uh, says that their standard of imprisonment and prison standards are not up to the requirements that the ICC is seeking, but also international standards, which Simon has already uh, referred to. Um, it is in this context that in 2010, in, the, at, in Kampala, the review conference, a resolution was issued. That's resolution RC slash res dot three which calls on uh, the strengthening, which was called strengthening uh, the enforcement of sentences. It was adopted in June 2010. And it emphasizes the need for enhanced international cooperation to enable more states to vo voluntarily accept sentenced persons on the basis of the widely um, accepted uh, treaty standards. Now, taking stock, Using this as a, as, a, as, a plat as a platform, we've had recourse to Article 87.6 of the Rome Statute, which is about the cooperation between the court and other intergovernmental organizations. And in particular, Article 3 and Article 15.2 of the United Nations, um, uh, of the negotiated relationship agreement between the court and the UN. Uh, which enables the court and the UN to engage into close cooperation. And once again, it's in that context, I'm just summarizing that now, that we concluded uh, in the summer, um, end of summer, an MOU with uh, UNODC. Um, I am almost done. Uh, two key provisions of the MOU, and then Philip will, will go into the details of that, are Article 3 on cooperation and consultation particularly with respect to increasing the capacity of states to enforce the sentences pronounced by the court in accordance with international standards and norms governing the treatment of prisoners and the management of prison facilities. And Article 6, which is about capacity building, which consists of helping each other to assess the national penitentiary systems of requesting states and to develop and implement uh, training and technical assistance programs. But I'm not going to go into the details, and that is essentially uh, what I had to say so far. Thank you very much, Hirad. Um, I think that was very useful. And then uh, the last speaker for this introductory phase is, is Philip. Uh, and after that, we will have uh, questions and answers. But Philip, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Um, welcome to all of you. Could we please put the PowerPoint presentation on? Thank you very much. Um, let me start by saying that it's, uh, or echo previous speakers, that it's a great privilege indeed to be here uh, together with you in order to co-present the recently concluded MOU between the ICC and the UN Office on Drugs and Crime. Now, building on the previous presentations and uh, uh, given that you all have the MOU in front of you, the focus of my presentation will be more on UNODC and its work uh, in the field of prison reform, including the sort of technical assistance services that we typically provide to member states in, in, in this area. Obviously, always having in mind the scenario addressed in the MOU, namely uh, uh, states parties who have concluded or who envisage to conclude a bilateral enforcement agreement with the ICC but which may face uh, persisting capacity constraints in their national prison systems. Um, I will be relatively short uh, on the issue of UNODC's mandate. Um, Simone has already uh, touched upon that point in her presentation. Uh, suffice to say that uh, within the UN system, UNODC acts as a custodian of these international standards and norms related to the treatment of prisoners. 
You may have certainly heard already of the most well-known of these, the standard minimum rules for the treatment of prisoners adopted back in 1957. But as you can see on the slide, the UN General Assembly has uh, uh, adopted a series of further standards over the course of time, including most recently the Bangkok rules on the treatment of women prisoners. And while all of these standards taken together address the issue of, of, of prisoners from slightly different angles, the overall chapeau or the overall objective, if you want, obviously remains the same, which is the treatment of prisoners in line with their inherent dignity as human beings. Now, as you will also see, three of the standards on the slide um, are explicitly referred to uh, in the bilateral enforcement agreements which the ICC has concluded so far. Um, these include the standard minimum rules for the treatment of prisoners. These are really a, a, a core document outlining the minimum requirements the prison administration should have in place, uh, ranging from issues related to prison management to staffing, prison conditions, health services, etc. The body of principles uh, for the protection of all persons under any form of detention or imprisonment are equally mentioned <clears throat> in the bilateral enforcement agreements. They have a slightly different focus, strong, excuse me, <clears throat> a stronger focus on procedural safeguards for uh, uh, prisoners, including access to legal advice, uh, contact to the outside world, independent inspections of prison facilities, etc. And finally, the third document referred to are the basic principles for the treatment of prisoners. Um, they add a number of provisions not addressed in previous standards, including, amongst others, a strong call for the restriction of the use of solitary confinement. Now, from UNODC's perspective and what we observe in practice in our work is that a large number of member states still struggle with implementing the provisions, for example, of the standard minimum rules. I mentioned they were adopted back in 1957, which shows that it was quite a progressive, demanding document at the time, but it also shows that a significant number of jurisdictions face serious issues in their prison systems. Now, if you look at the global picture, this does not really come as a surprise. Prison populations continue to grow on all continents, uh, reaching in 2013 a total number of 11 million prisoners worldwide. I would like to draw your attention in particular to the chart on the right-hand side of this slide, which describes the prison population as a percentage of the prison system's overall capacity. Uh, and you will see that on average prison systems in some regions, including in Africa and in Asia, for example, operated by 140 and 150 percent um, of their capacity respectively. Uh, in the Americas as well, well beyond uh, capacity, followed by Europe, where in 2010 it was still below but close to 100 percent. As you see on the graph on the left-hand side, these high levels of prison overcrowding are often mirrored by a high share of individuals who are still awaiting trial or whose trial is ongoing, um, reaching an average percentage of up to 40% in some regions. But this just for your uh, uh, background, prison overcrowding obviously is a key issue facing prison administrations all over the world, but there is other uh, 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 challenges that we uh, uh, observe in the course of our technical assistance in the field. Obviously, amongst them, infrastructural constraints and poor prison conditions, which apart from the impact they have on the prisoners uh, themselves, also often undermine prison safety and security. There is often a lack of involvement of other governmental stakeholders who have a role to play in prison settings, be it the Ministry of Health, the Ministry of Social Affairs and others. Uh, we often see a lack of rehabilitation programs, obviously very important if you want to ensure that prisoners reintegrate smoothly upon release. Health services are an issue facing many prison administration. Health services in prisons are typically of a much lower standard than those in the public health system, which is particularly detrimental in the prison context as the health profile of prisoners tends to be worse than the health profile in the general prison population. Finally, there is a limited ability of many administrations to cater for vulnerable groups of prisoners who have special needs, be it elderly prisoners, be it younger prisoners, be it women, 
uh, prisoners with disabilities or foreign national prisoners. And last but not least, many prison systems tend to be partly or completely isolated from the community, including a lack of independent external oversight. Now, there are lots of challenges. Uh, obviously, we cannot address all of them, but nevertheless, uh, some insights into what UNODC does uh, in order to assist member states in this field. Um, our services can be categorized into two, uh, two fields, more or less. The first is a preparation of uh, guidance material, uh, often drafted and validated in the course of international expert group meetings involving prison practitioners from all over the world. We have recently concluded a comprehensive handbook on strategies to reduce prison overcrowding, uh, which may be of relevance here, um, and are currently preparing for a handbook on prisoners of high risk, which may equally be interesting. It will address or it will provide guidance on individuals involved in organized crime, violent extremism, drug trafficking, etc. Uh, all of which, of course, pose unique management challenges for prison administrations. The more important issue uh, for us today here is obviously technical assistance. Um, Simone has already been mentioned that we uh, provide such programs in around 14 member states uh, at the moment. Um, all of these programs are, of course, typically preceded by an in-depth assessment of a national prison system in order to come up with a tailored program and services. Now, when it comes to the areas that we typically look into in uh, the course of our programs, they include the ones displayed on the slide right now. Obviously, legislative review. We review jointly with our counterparts national prison laws, but also prison regulations and standing orders. Um, we provide guidance on various aspects of prison management, be it core management policies such as classification and sentence planning, but also more technical aspects such as prisoner file management or advice on internal and external inspection mechanisms. We look into the extent to which resort is made to alternatives of imprisonment, uh, community sanctions and probation, a key instrument if you want to reduce uh, uh, rates of prison overcrowding. Uh, we work together with prison administrations to initiate rehabilitation programs, including educa education, vocational training, and work. And we provide support in penitentiary health care. Uh, penitentiary healthcare. In, with regards to our implementation modalities, there is typically a very strong focus on training for prison staff at different levels. Uh, regardless of the infrastructural situation, the prison staff will be the major resource that every prison administration has at its disposal. Uh, we cooperate closely, uh, be it within the UN or beyond, uh, with other organizations such as the Department of Peacekeeping Operations, the UN Office on Project Services, um, the International Committee for the Red Cross and others. Now, I would like to emphasize again what has already been mentioned, that the reform approach that I just described would not significantly change in case it includes an inmate or inmates sentenced by the court. The overall approach would still be to assist the prison administration to improve its compliance with international standards and norms. As such, as has been said, there, we would expect significant positive spillover effects uh, not only benefiting the conditions of imprisonment of these one or two individuals sentenced by the court, but benefiting the, benefiting the entire prison administration and prison population. And UNODC's work in the course of its maritime crime program and the work we have done on uh, piracy suspects and convicts is certainly a case in point in this regard because it was a similar approach we have taken. Um, I know we are running a bit uh, short of time. What I would have done now, but I would like to seek the guidance uh, uh, from, from the ambassador. In order to illustrate what I've just been saying, we have prepared a short documentary of one of our prison reform programs. Um, but uh, I would leave it to you, uh, uh, Madam Ambassador, to, to decide on whether we have enough time for that or not. Questions, Thank you, Philip. Thank you very much. Um, so I, I would like to ask you, would you like to see this documentary? Uh, it is 10 minutes, or do you have other questions? I prefer to spend your time on, on questions and answers. 
Are there any questions? Let's start with the questions. Yes. Okay, let's let's show the documentary. I will need to give you a short introduction. Um, it is a, a documentary of one of our prison reform, of one of our more comprehensive uh, uh, prison reform programs, uh, which was implemented in uh, the Kyrgyz Republic. Uh, the reasons for what, why we chose this example is that the results uh, of this program were very well documented. Um, it goes without saying that this is without prejudice to the fact that the Kyrgyz Republic is not yet a state party to the ICC, but received this assistance in the course of a regular cooperation between UNODC and the UN member state. Um, the excerpts that you will see focus on a number of components that we addressed uh, in the course of this program, including rehabilitation programs, prison staff capacity building, and uh, infrastructural support. So. We have to apologize for the fact that obviously you will need to rely on the subtitles as the documentary is in Kyrgyz and, and Russian, but there is English subtitles. Thank you. В то время уголовно-исполнительная система Кыргызстана сталкивается со многими трудностями, включая ограниченное финансирование, плохие материальные условия содержания заключенных, невозможность раздельного содержания разных категорий осужденных, перенаселенность отдельных учреждений, развал производств и отсутствие надлежащего профессионально-технического образования заключенных. Решение этих проблем является залогом создания современной и эффективной системы исполнения наказаний. В 2009 году был запущен проект Европейского Союза и Управления ООН по наркотикам и преступности «Поддержка реформы пенитенциарной системы в Кыргызской Республике». Проект направлен на оказание помощи Кыргызской Республике в укреплении верховенства права путем дальнейшего совершенствования системы исполнения наказаний. Проект предусматривает комплексный подход, который включает продвижение дальнейшего развития законодательства, повышение управленческих навыков сотрудников системы исполнения наказаний, улучшение условий содержания, развитие производств на базе исправительных учреждений, продвижение социальной реинтеграции заключенных, а также содействие в разработке стратегии дальнейшего реформирования пенитенциарной системы Кыргызской Республики. процентов тюремного населения Кыргызстана – это мужчины, это молодые мужчины. И если они не заняты каким-либо а, трудом или, или не заняты, а, или не обучаются, то понятно, что это приводит и к насилию, и к определенному напряжению в пенитенциарных учреждениях. Потребляемая мощность 17 киловатт-часов. С двух печек можно приготовить за час 250 булок хлеба. Вот эта печка последней модели. Чтобы заменить оборудование и увеличить производство, в третьей колонии решили написать бизнес-план в рамках проекта «Поддержка реформы пенитенциарной системы». И в скором времени намеченное удалось реализовать. Ушел помещение полностью. Вот это здание они помогли отремонтировать. Поставили две печи, тестомес и душевую кабину. Как и в женской колонии, здесь работает профессиональное техническое училище. Его выпускники получают профессию, а значит, смогут не только зарабатывать деньги, пока находятся за решеткой, но и найти потом работу на воле. Два года, как мы открыли здесь курсы пекарей. В прошлом году обучались 26 осужденных. Дали им в руки сертификат. В этом году я преподаю 28 заключенным. Что хорошо, мы можем совместить теорию с практикой, потому что есть у нас пекарня. Только не хватает вот учебных пособий. После запуска предприятий с проверкой колонии посетила делегация аудиторов от Европейского Союза. Гости дали свою оценку проделанной работе. Для нас очень важно, чтобы после того, как проект закончится, все навыки, которым обучались люди, и все это оборудование, которое предоставлено, чтобы все это продолжало приносить пользу стране, чтобы все это было устойчивым после того, как мы отойдем от этого. В ГСН же уверены, что затраченные усилия не пропадут даром.
те проекты, которые у нас открыли вот при поддержке Евросоюза, они будут постоянно в рабочем в работоспособном состоянии. Потому что все-таки молоко, хлеб – это продукты потребления. А швейные изделия, осужденных тоже нужно одевать, и нас, сотрудников, тоже нужно одевать. Надо занять э, осужденных работой. Это первостепенная задача. То, чтобы они э, были заняты, плюс еще зарабатывали какую-то иную сумму, э, закрывали свои как бы, исковые долги, плюс э, как бы выделялось для них, для себя какие-то суммы, чтобы ну, для бытовых целей. Вот, когда будут заняты люди, у них, оказывается, и в мыслях будет другая мысль. То есть заработать, получить какую-то специальность ну, и приспособиться то есть, к дальнейшей жизни. И так я понимаю. Вообще Видя положительные результаты проделанной работы, кыргызское правительство согласилось поддержать три новых проекта и вложить в них 22 миллиона сомов. Но для дальнейшего реформирования пенитенциарной системы без донорской помощи все равно не обойтись. Но производство в местах лишения свободы выгодно не только заключенным. По мнению специалистов, правильно организованное дело внутри колонии поможет решить множество и других проблем. Рыночная стоимость многих товаров и услуг она очень высока. Колонии не могут приобрести себе хорошего качества, хорошего ну, те виды товаров, которые им нужны. Поэтому происходит то, что покупают меньше. Используя собственное производство, это позволяет им сократить свои издержки, выпускать по минимальной себестоимости и при этом обеспечивать в полном объеме. То есть у людей будут свои собственные кровати, тумбочки, свои собственное постельное белье, хлеб, который у них производится, молоко и так далее и тому подобное. Для того, чтобы не только запустить предприятия, но и научиться ими управлять, в рамках проекта для сотрудников ГСН были разработаны обучающие программы. За пять дней работники из правительных учреждений написали и защитили бизнес-планы. Некоторые из них удалось реализовать. Это пекарня, швейный цех и цех по производству соевого молока. Текучесть кадров очень большая, сотрудники уходят и приходят, поэтому проект недолговечен. Но результаты этого проекта, то есть те модули, которые мы разработали, и те учебники, которые теперь останутся, они будут полезны не только для системы пенитенциарной, но и для любой системы государственного управления, где есть такое партнерство, когда государство создает государственные предприятия внутри, но они коммерческого уровня. В рамках проекта было проведено множество семинаров и по другим темам, таким как управление исправительным учреждением и тюремным персоналом, работа с заключенными, приговоренными к пожизненному сроку, инвалидами, пожилыми людьми и детьми, а также по стратегическому планированию. Они смогли составить стратегию развития уголовной системы на 2014-2016 годы. Вот, данная стратегия уже утверждена постановлением правительства, и сейчас в рамках данного проекта стратегии работает уголовная исполнительная система. Стратегия – пошаговая инструкция развития уголовной исполнительной системы до 2016 года. Это первый документ такого рода. Когда вот создавали стратегию, высчитывали все полностью, где нужно, какие финансы, что нам надо делать, что надо для развития уголовной исполнительной системы. Это учебный план, который был утвержден. С официальным приказом к сынам. Также в рамках проекта были проведены обучающие семинары для тренеров учебного центра ГСИН. Был разработан учебный план и учебные модули, по которым теперь будут проводиться занятия. Учебный центр, который был создан в 2003 году, количество сотрудников очень мало. У них всего лишь три сотрудника. Значит, как преподаватели обычно действуют сотрудники КСИНа, которые добровольно читают лекции, и поэтому очень важно для нас усилить вот их потенциал ну, с учебным планом в руках и с учебным модулем уже легче станет преподавать.
Но помимо трудоустройства заключенных, в тюрьмах Кыргызстана есть и множество других нерешенных вопросов. За годы независимости большой проблемой стали санитарные условия в колониях. И вся канализация пришла на негодность. И мы имеем даже, э -э можем получить такой скандал, потому как вот в Молдавановском кусту из-за вот этой канализации сгнили, да, вот эти туберкулезные палочки попасть могут в чую, понимаете? И потом она может выйти там где-то на Казахстане. Поэтому в рамках проекта было решено потратить 700 тысяч евро на ремонт банно-прачечных комплексов, системы водоснабжения, канализации и вентиляции в четырех колониях, в которых содержится около трех тысяч осужденных. Это те же наши граждане, просто лишенные свободы, то есть... Отделил народ от, от народа, то есть мы отдельно содержим, чтобы они понесли то наказание, но не, да, не надо их отлучать от тех, кто же нормальных человеческих условий. Спасибо! Открытие бана прачечного комплекса в колонии 47 в Бишкеке, несмотря на снег и мороз, стало настоящим праздником. От того, что здесь было раньше, остались только стены. После капитального ремонта это здание не узнать. После официальной части все собравшиеся смогли посмотреть новые отремонтированные помещения. Это прачечная. Будет стирать осужденные, здесь сушить и там повесят для сушки. Не меньше ждали открытия бана прачечного комплекса и в Молдавановке. Здесь решили снести старое здание и построить новое с нуля. Сами сотрудники колонии говорят, что таких бан нет даже на воле. Когда осужденные бастуют, когда они что-то требуют, одним из таких требований, значит, банно-прочечный комплекс, чистое белье, чистое постельное белье и другие моменты. А это помогает нам по соблюдению режима и стабильности, оперативной стабильности в местах лишения свободы. Should we get some lights on again, maybe? <laughs> so this was yours. So um, we still have ten minutes left, uh, and I think this is a good opportunity for you to to ask the questions you want whether it is on the work on the UNODC or whether it is more on, on entering into enforcement agreement with the court. So we have the expertise on both issues here. So the floor is open for any questions. I know it is warm in here, but... Um, <laughs> France? Thank you. Good morning. Um, just a question um, related to the um, enforcement convention. Has the ICC identified the main reason uh, why states are not really willing to sign such convention? Okay. Uh, Hilda, maybe you want to comment on that? Yes, we are actually still debating within the presidency whether to make these reasons public fully or not, because every state comes with their own explanations. But it's difficult to establish when roughly 40%, 45% don't respond. It's, it's very difficult to come up with the clear statistical reasons as to why. So of the remaining 60 or so percent, and this is not, this is a rough estimate, it may be more or less. Um, as I said, one, the main, cons the main reason raised is precisely the lack of prison systems meeting the international standards.
follow up from France? Yes, come on. That was my second question. Um, are we to understand, because of the Omayu with UN on DC, that maybe uh, UN on DC will be uh, the institution who is going to assess the prison system, maybe? Because w the question was raised, uh, we were asking how the ICC are going to um, to do, or how can we really decide that uh, a state or which state meet the international standards? And the question was, we don't know actually. So it's just a, an open question. I'm not saying that you're going to. Thank you. Yep. Please hear that. I think you should comment on that. Oops. Thank you. Okay. What I I foresee uh, the thing which is going to happen most probably is that from now now that we have the MOU signed, if and when a state responds, kind enough to respond, and then when they respond, they say that they have an issue which is related to prison standards, then we will probably we will definitely invite connect the state and UNODC. And the assessment work, of course, technically will be conducted by UNODC because they know better than they have the expertise. But we'll, we'll do that on a, in a collaborative, of course, basis. And then if Simon and Philip want to supplement that. No, thank you very much. Just to, just to compliment, in case, in case UNODC uh, was approached by, by a member state with, with that question, obviously, what we start no, let me, let me put it differently. The first step would be an assessment of the national penitentiary system. Now, uh, UNODC is not a formal international inspection body, um, but we would certainly be in a position to partner with the National Prison Administration to jointly look into the status quo of the prison system and to identify issues which would need to be addressed, taking into account the international standards that have been referred to. Yes, you have the floor. Um, I have a question in terms of uh, how uh, uh, you assess where eventually if these uh, agreements are there with states, uh, prisoners will be sent because I've learned that uh, uh, family visits is a big issue in terms of the voluntary uh, funding or the fund that's being created. So I'd like to le learn a little bit more how you uh, want to include this, this important thing of uh, family visits uh, for prisoners or future prisoners. Thank you. So Hirad will answer that. Well, the statute and the rules and the regulations of the court foresee a procedure to designate the state of enforcement. When the time comes to do that, the court will uh, not only have to seek the views of the state, any of the states with which it has, which are on the list of enforcement, as I said, so far eight of them, in fact seven, um, but also it must seek the views of the convicted person. And then we haven't had it yet, we haven't reached that stage yet, but uh, so it's, it's a bit hypothetical what I'm, what I'm mentioning. And this is going to be conducted by the presidency as a bench of three judges in truth. So it's a bit different from the other ad hoc, etc., tribunals where the registrar takes directly an administrative decision. Here it would be also a, a sort of a hybrid administrative decision, but taken by a bench of three judges constituting the presidency. So all these challenges will have to be assessed. It's going to be a case-by-case -case approach. In abstract, it's very difficult for me to say what do we do if and when a state says no to family visits. I mean, everybody knows that when the presidency on pre pre-conviction family visits uh, issued a decision six years ago what the reaction was. So we'll do our best if and when the time comes to deal with that to, to, to address it. But, but we do recognize that it is a challenge and there are many other challenges also. Just one point about questions, um, which I thought was a very good question that, of course, all of these assessments are upon request of a state. Um, so states' roles are very much respected in this, number one, and, and the assessments are not only for states who are envisaging um, entering into an agreement with, with the court, but states who already have as well. So it covers both. 
Um, and I, I think that's an important point to, to make as well. Thank you. So if there are no more questions, I will give the floor again to Hirad for a final remark before we wrap up. Um, first and foremost to thank you and uh, the Netherlands for having uh, co-hosted uh, our organized event. It was really important for us, from the, for the court. It's extremely crucial that this matter be addressed seriously at the states parties and of course civil society uh, level. Most grateful for those states parties and civil society members who've made the effort to be here. And as Simon said, and, and I correct what I said, the current MOU will also apply to those states that so far have responded over the years to the ICC and have raised this issue. So we will now also process on that basis. Thank you. So then it remains for me only to thank all of you who were here. I hope you had a fruitful session here. And um, thanks to the panelists for being here and for sharing their experience. Thank you. Have a good afternoon. <laughs>